Noriel, I want to go right to the heart of it. You say it differently than Lawrence Summers. We have stagflation. We also have debt on top of it. You're looking at your stagflationary debt crisis. Is it here? Uh, it's on its way here. Uh, I agree with Ray Dalio. I agree with Larry Summers and many others who worry that they're going to be overheating because we have a loose monetary and fiscal policy, and that could lead to inflation. But I have a second worry and a third worry. The second worry is that in addition to aggregate demand becoming excessive, we're going to su suffer supply bottlenecks. And those supply bottlenecks are not the short-term ones driven by, say, unemployment benefits. I've identified nine forces that are much more secular, that like in the 70s represent negative global supply shocks that reduce potential growth, increase the cost of production, and with loose monetary and fiscal policy can lead not only to inflation, but also to stagflation, a combination of inflation and recession like we had in the 1970s when you had two oil shocks. And on top of it, compared to the 70s now, right. debt ratios, private and public, are much higher. <clears throat> so at that time when the Fed went and fought inflation with Volcker, we had a severe double-dip recession, but we did not have a debt crisis. After right. the GFC, we had a debt crisis, but we had low inflation because there was a negative demand shock. So we could have the worst of stagflation of the 70s and worse of a debt crisis okay. like after the GFC. Noriel, I want to go back to your Istanbul in the old world. I want to go back to Genoa and Venice when John Farrell's ancestors were doing battle with the huge industrial changes of that time, the 14th century. Just for the record, the, they were in Sicily. Tom. Okay, well, same <laughs> thing. <laughs> That's Carry just on, out please. there. Don't Carry on, please. Story, Down the right? Adriatic. <laughs> Noriel, Never we does. have seen over time historic change. How does America do secular stagnation when we have a tech juggernaut like we're observing right now with Apple, Amazon, Google, and that? How do we bring their excellence over to the American experience? Well, uh, even Larry Summers, who was worried about uh, secular stagnation, now worries about uh, inflation. Uh, the trouble is that we're facing a whole problems uh, from a political point of view in terms of a gridlock, uh, not just in the U.S., but also in other parts of the world, because there are lots of people who are left behind. And whether they're voting for Trump or they're voting for Democrats or voting uh, in Europe for populist party of the right and the left, they're against uh, globalization, they're against uh, technology, they're against hyper-digitalization. But we also live in a world in which, as I pointed out, I worry that in spite of technology maybe as it has been in the last 20 years, a force for deflation, there are other forces that are going to be stagflationary. They're going to be reducing potential growth and increased cost of production. Because of inequality, we have deglobalization, we have protectionism, and everybody wants to defend their own firms and workers. We're going to now see balkanizations of global supply chains and the reshoring of manufacturing from low-cost China to U.S. and Europe. We're now having aging of population not only U.S., Europe, advanced economies, but also in key emerging markets like China, Korea, East Asia, Russia. We're restricting migration now increasingly from south to north. And migration was something that kept a lead on wage pressures in advanced economies. We're going to have this decoupling between U.S. and China because of this Cold War becoming colder. There's even a risk of a hot war. Decoupling on technology, on trade, data, information, the Internet, financial flows. Uh, global climate change is also stagflationary. Look at what's happening with lack of water, even in California. One third of all vegetables, two thirds of all fruits and nuts are produced in, in uh, California, and now they don't have water. And the farms who have water rights rather sell it for something else. We'll have a shock to, say, food prices. Pandemics uh, that are going to recur and imply self reliance of countries on their own domestic supply. Cyber attacks are leading again to disruption of uh, production when they occur, or the firms will have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to try to reduce the risk of cyber attacks, and that's going to be another cost. Nouria, and there's so much points, to get through. Just get to the final point if you can, please. against inequality, and the policies are going to be pro-worker, pro-union, pro-wages, and so on, and that's going to put upward pressure on wages. Right. So I, knew these are I, I knew I wasn't forces. going to be able to cut you off there because you were in full flow. Noria, I'll just take a breath just for a second. Yeah. Just want to frame what you're saying because I think it's so important. You're making a supply side call on the economy here. 
A lot of people believe that we'll get this supply side response as the year grows older, that people will start to come back to the workforce from September onwards. You're saying that's not going to develop in the way people anticipate. Can we put some numbers on this, Nouriel? The participation well, rate in America, the degree do you think it will recover, things like that. Just work through it with us. Well, you know, I do believe that there are some short-term supply bottlenecks and maybe in the labor market, unemployment benefits, the lack of childcare, the fact that schools have not reopened may have led some workers not wanting to return to the labor market and put up for pressure. But in my view, even when those short-term factors go away, I just described nine factors that have nothing to do with the short-term, have to do with the medium-term. Each one of them is a negative supply shock and is a medium term. In particular, the last one, this backlash against the inequality implies that in the past, we didn't have the protection of labor. But now look at the first, we had $3 trillion last year care program of fiscal stimulus, then 900 billion in December. The first Biden plan, 1.9 trillion, went mostly to what? Workers, unemployed, partial employed, those left behind. Rightly yeah. so, because there is so much inequality, you cannot do otherwise. But that put the labor in a situation of strength. Right now, given the massive transfer, you can afford waiting longer before you get a lousy job or a burger flipping job. And that tilts the balance of power between labor and capital. And redistribution is going to be not like in the past from labor to capital, but from capital to labor. Let's pick from up on that point, Nouriel. Let's Those are medium-term trends. This is really, really Those... important. Lisa, this shift away from capital and the leverage shifting towards labor. That's a huge effort of this administration, and they're pretty open about it. Yeah, and the idea here yeah. is that the Federal Reserve perhaps isn't helping things along. Nouriel, we just have about a minute left, and I'm wondering what the Fed can do in this circumstance that's driven by so many other factors, whether it's supply bottlenecks or rejiggering of the labor market. What can they actually do to forestall the stagflationary push? Well, my view is that the Fed, like other central banks, are in a debt trap. Then if you do, and then if you don't. Because if I'm right about overheating and stagflation, they should be tightening policy sooner and get out of tapering right now to avoid inflation getting out of control. But if they were to try to do that, given the stocks of debt that are much higher now than 10, 20, 30 years ago, private and public, then you'll have a crash in the bond market, a crash in the debt market, a crash in the stock market. You're not going to have a double deep recession like the early 80s. You're going to have actually a depression. And between doing that and the latter choice of keep on monetizing large fiscal deficits and letting inflation gradually rise, the latter choice is going to be by default the one they're going to choose, and therefore inflation is going to come back, and then stagflation is going to come back. Yeah. So it's not as if the Fed is evil. We are in a debt trap. We're not just in fiscal dominance. Today we're in a debt trap because both private and public debt are excessive, and each central bank is trapped, and they're not going to be able to exit is unconventional monetary policy Maria, this because been, the markets and the economies are going to crash. This has been so depressing. I always have to tell everybody that you're actually a really happy guy. I always have to tell everyone after the interview's concluded that Rubini... Nouriel usually <clears throat> smiles, Tom. He's a happy guy away from these interviews. I'm a happy and, guy, but I'm I realistic about the future.